We're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Pete Knutson. Pete Knutson is a Seattle-based fisherman and a teacher at Seattle Central Community College. And he uh, has been on the show before talking about issues related to the Port of Seattle. So last time we were speaking with you, you were bringing us up to speed on the port's plan to gentrify a fisherman's terminal. I'm wondering if you can tell us about that. Start out and maybe give us kind of an overview. It seems there's two issues currently that you're dealing with. Well, let me let me just um, let's see where should we start. Uh, well, Fisherman's Terminal. Uh, you might have some of your viewers might not know where it's at. It's at uh, uh, the um, Ballard Bridge on the west side. Uh, so I guess it'll be the southwest side of the Ballard Bridge. And uh, uh, people don't realize the uh, impact, the economic impact of the fishing industry in Seattle. And Fisherman's Terminal alone, uh, according to the port's uh, economic studies, uh, you can find these on their website, produces an expanded economic impact, about 5,000 jobs. Uh, in terms of business revenues and wages, you're looking at half a billion annually. Uh, this is a major manufacturing plant in the center of the city of Seattle. Uh, the one difference between uh, this facility that the port manages and the other facilities is that it's not one large multinational corporation. It's about 350 small businesses. And so I, that has a, the fact that it's small business as opposed to a multinational changes the way that the port deals with, with, uh, with that facility. Well, compared, for instance, with uh, some of its other facilities that it's invested heavily in uh, over the last few years, the uh, cruise industry. Sure. Uh, well, cruise, for example, they, uh, uh, they've been working very hard to bring the cruise industry in. Now, um, uh, bear in mind that the cruise industry is essentially a low-wage industry. Uh, these are offshore corporations based in the Caymans and Bahamas. Don't pay federal income taxes. Um, they, uh, they received uh, $110 million this session uh, from the Port Commission to build a new facility at Pier 91. Uh, they are getting a, a $1 million tax rebate and two years of free mortgage. Uh, now, uh, the economic data that we have from 2003 that compares crews with Fisherman's Terminal shows that the tax revenues generated from the fishermen uh, compared to the crews is about 10 times. It's a multiple of about 10. When you compare the average cruise wage that's generated in the Seattle economy with the fishing wage, the fishing wage is doubled. It's about $69,000, an expanded uh, average uh, wage. So, uh, and then the overall impact as of 2003 is about five or six times as much just from the fisherman's terminal portion of the Seattle fishing industry. I'm not talking about the downtown factory trawlers, just fishermen. So you've got this huge disparity in treatment between here's your old line industry that, that's not a smokestack going away type industry. It is vital. Most of those small boats down there are being managed in sustainable fisheries. We have in the North Pacific sustainable halibut fisheries, sustainable black cod fisheries. Particularly in Alaska, we have sustainable salmon fisheries. So this is a long-term uh, piece of the Seattle economy. And it's also critical in terms of what we're, what we're coming to be more aware of, which is the local food economy. That this is another component in terms of putting together local farmland, local fisheries. Um, and because it has been there since 1913, because Fisherman's Terminal has been there since 1913, we have a core of industrial workers, skilled workers, um, Electro, electro, electronics people. We have battery companies. We have sail makers that do, do all kinds of uh, all kinds of work. We've got haul out places, shipyards. There's no other place on the west coast of the United States that has this density of um, production. You know, and 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 so when you look at America today, which is being which has been deindustrialized as a result of all these trade agreements that allowed the multinationals to move all the manufacturing jobs, we would be foolish to allow this thing, a uh, fisherman's terminal, to, to die the death of a thousand cuts and, and not nurture this. And essentially, the fishermen down there want to be able to pursue their craft. They want support. Instead, the port has, by and large, responded with benign neglect. And, and even now, uh, the port is, is pushing in the direction of what they call redevelopment. 
I've heard Fisherman's Terminal referred to by some port commissioners as being underdeveloped, like an underdeveloped third world country. Uh, and I don't know what that means. I mean, when I look at the economic stats, you know, 5,000 jobs coming out of 19 acres, there's more jobs per acre out of that little piece of Fisherman's Terminal than any other port facility. That's not underdeveloped. You know, that's not, I mean, my measure of development is sustainable jobs. So there is a push, though. And, um, you know, this goes back to 2001. You mentioned uh, that's when we started this thing. And, and that's when the uh, mission of Fisherman's Terminal was being altered by the port to include um, non-manufacturing, non-working boats, uh, pleasure boats and so forth. And at the time, when they started doing that, we said, you watch. This, they are following the same pattern that every other harbor in North America has followed. Uh, if you don't stand up for your working people, um, the wealthy uh, and the developers and the bond underwriters, they move in and they, uh, they replace uh, really uh, an economy that's uh, distributing lots of money to the, in terms of the common average population with something that just services, you know, the wealthy, essentially. Do we want to go there? I don't think so. So talk about the two latest proposals coming out of the port of Seattle for fishermen's terminal that directly impact you. One is uh, the net sheds. Right. And the other is fees they want to lobby against you for selling fish. Right. Um, it seems like every, every, every other year there's a new proposal the port launches, which, which makes life difficult down there for the fishermen. Two years ago, it was they were going to ban all fishermen liveaboards. This was after four of our people died in the water down there one winter. Uh, and, um, you know, the port wasn't taking care of the safety situation. They were fined by labor and industries. Uh, and so, so anyway, um, we finally got those docks replaced. They were killer docks. It was a death trap. As I said, we had four people die in one winter. Uh, these were Depression-era docks, should have been replaced 30 years ago, especially a big manufacturing component of the Seattle economy. So the new docks went in, and we thought, well, okay, maybe, may, just maybe, we can have some peace down there, and we can go about our business. But, uh, but lo and behold, um, the port came up with a proposal to um, essentially evict, de facto eviction is what I call it, the fishermen from their workspaces. When you go down to Fisherman's Terminal, you will see that about half the land footprint is covered by large, tall, blue buildings. These are called net sheds. Half of them have been there since about 1920, 30. The other half are, are fairly new. Um, and these are the places where uh, when the halibut guys come back from the North Pacific, they, um, they store their, their tubs of ganyans and all their buoys and their gear, king crab gear, gill net, purse seine. Um, and in these net sheds, you know, the guys have their drill presses. They've got their workbenches. Um, and over time, these are very tall buildings. Um, initially, they were built to hang uh, and dry out nets, uh, and, and now that we've moved into nylon as opposed to old cotton nets, the fishermen have, in order to get more storage and get more productivity out of that space, they have built uh, levels. They've built what we call lofts, and they're critical uh, because uh, they're probably over 50 percent of the storage is in these lofts, and so you'll drive a forklift in there. You'll have a ton of fishing gear. You, you pull up the forklift, put it up on the second story, and it's very efficient. The port is proposing to rip out all of those lofts. The port is proposing that fishermen be required to take all their gear out of the locker, put it out on the street, and then port personnel are going to go in and rip out all internal structures. They claim the rationale for this, they claim, is uh, fire because we have a sprinkler system that runs on the uh, uh, roof of the building. But when you start poking at their rationale, it falls apart. Okay, the first thing that could be done is, okay, if these lofts are, are blocking the sprinkler system, you can run vertical pipes coming down with sprinkler heads oh, maybe every eight foot, and you can, you can cover it in that way. And that's called an in-rack sprinkler system. I talked to the Seattle Fire Department. They said, sure, you've got contractors that can do that. So for a fairly, quite modest sum by port standards, you could facilitate that, uh, allow the fishermen to keep working without interruption. Uh, the other part of that is that the new, the new net sheds that have been built have no sprinklers whatsoever. 
And so we say to the port, well, there's no sprinklers whatsoever. There's no fire protection whatsoever. Are you going to, are you going to invest the money to put spring? Oh, no, we're not going to invest the money. Well, then why are you ripping the lofts out and the storage out if you're not even going to invest the money? And they go, well, if it's not a fire uh, problem in that situation, then we're, we're calling it a structural issue. And we're going, structural issue? These lofts actually tie the structure together, make it stronger. You know, bring in a structural engineer if you have problems. Anyway, bottom line is the rationale falls apart. And what we see happening, and the port has, has had this in the works for a number of years. Uh, 2001, they commissioned a study, a uh, $50,000 study, to prepare Fisherman's Terminal for sale to a private buyer uh, and to just divide it into discrete portions. Um, to research the background of Fisherman's Terminal, to make sure that the fishermen did not have any restrictive covenants when Great Northern deeded that to the, to the Port of Seattle. They were preparing for um, massive change. Into, they were preparing to deindustrialize the facility. Uh, when, when I got a copy of those documents back in 2002, I went to the Port Commission and I said, you told us that when you stuck yachts in here, which are inappropriate in an industrial facility and probably violate city zoning, which is heavy industrial zoning. Uh, you told us that there was no ulterior motive, that you weren't going to push this towards real estate. Here's the contract. You lied to us. The contract was already signed when you told us that. And you know what the port commissioners said? They said, uh, we don't know where that came from. We didn't sign that $50,000 contract. So the question is, uh, who did in the port? Uh, and so, so, you know, that's one of the structural problems with the port is that the commissioners essentially do not have control over the bureaucracy. They don't have a salary. They, um, uh, you know, without being paid a salary, they don't, have, they don't have their own staff. And so they have to rely on the habitual staff that's always there. And of course, staff can prepare a situation for the commissioners, which makes it look self-evident that of course you've got to tear down this old structure. And, um, you know, these, these fishermen are not exactly upstanding citizens, as they once said. Um, and so you've got a structure and of course vested interests that make a lot of money off the port cultivate that senior staff and that's how that's how control operates at the port of Seattle okay so you got the net shed issue and then the other issue that's that's current right now is um, they're proposing to begin taxing fishermen who sell their own fish to the public at fishermen's terminal now now this is uh, this is a huge departure from uh, the mission of Fisherman's Terminal. When it was set up in 1913, at the founding statement, founding ceremony, our Hiram Chittenden, the brigadier general that designed the locks here, uh, he said that one of the key functions of the terminal was to help the fishermen sell their product. And the public supported that. And there was a public levy to build that. That's a, a key part of the local food economy, that people can go down there, like you can come, you can come down today to my boat if you want to talk to me about it. I'm, I'm on the west wall. My boat's called Nord, and we, we sell frozen fish, Alaskan fish that we dress on board. Uh, and people have been doing that for 90 years. Well, the port began to move this industrial facility in a retail direction in 1989. And at that time, they, install, they tore down a perfectly good restaurant, built another one. They put in a fish market. And the fish market they put in pays a percentage of their gross to the port. And at that time, uh, the first, they started stopping fishermen from selling a lot of their products at Fisherman's Terminal. In 1992, they, they, they shut down a little family called the Gilnet family. They were trollers, and, and they came and put them out of business. Uh, and then 1995, they passed new regulations to stop fishermen from selling anything that was uh, frozen, taken to, uh, uh, you know, that was vacuum packed, any of that, any of that stuff. Health department's fine with it. The health, it's not a health department issue. So the port put these restraints of trade on the fishing fleet to benefit their own retailer. I mean, it's ironic because when you hear the Port of Seattle talking about their mission, it's, oh, we're promoting international trade. We're promoting free trade. You know, we want to break down trade barriers. But then when you look at what they're doing at Fisherman's Terminal, they're imposing restraints of trade on us, on the, on the fishing fleet. So um, there is a proposal, and we're having a meeting an advisory meeting next Thursday morning at 8.30 at Fisherman's Terminal. And it's a public meeting. Anyone can come. Uh, it's down Kitty Corner from the Highliner Tavern down there. Uh, and they're going to propose, probably going to propose a tax 
Uh, and those of us that are opposed to this and see this as, as, as a, as a uh, sort of a privatization of, of Fisherman's Terminal in a way, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to appeal to the, to the public. A lot of people like to come down and buy fish. You know, we get people drive, making, last week I had a, had a woman from um, Arlington, uh, just moved up here from Georgia. She works for Boeing up there. She'd heard about us selling fish off the boat, and she made a trip all the way in. You know, so there's a lot of people from all over the place that want that connection. They want to come down, support the direct producers at the farmer's market. You know, my son's out there at the U District today selling our fish. They want to support producers. People are concerned about where their food comes from. They're concerned about, you know, chain of custody. I mean, all these stories now about melamine from, uh, in food from China, from, you know, uh, adulterated food, GMs. People want that chain of custody. And, and so part of what we're trying to do with the fishing industry is move the fishermen away from a commodity model of production where you go out, what we call dump truck fish, go out, catch a huge volume of fish, and then sell it for pennies to a big multinational. And we're telling the guys, you know, catch fewer fish, dress those fish on board, add quality, and sell them directly. You know, it, it's easier on the environment. You're going to have more money in your pocket. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it, it creates more prosperity. So that's, that's one of the reasons we're so upset about this port proposal to start taxing fishermen is that it's this progressive movement that we're pushing down there. The meeting you spoke about coming up, is that with the Fishermen's Terminal Advisory Committee? Correct. Okay. And Correct. what has been their position on these fees that are uh, the port's trying to impose? Well, uh, first of all, the advisory committee is a mixed body. It's appointed by the port. It's not democratically elected. There are people on there who are compromised in, in, in the sense that they have contracts with the port. They make money from the port. There's a, sort of a minority of us who are fishermen who are on there. But even so, even this compromised body... Um, came out and has, said, has voted twice, the, uh, told the port, essentially, you need to take these restraints of trade off the fishermen, and they have not supported a tax on the fishermen. So uh, this is coming from port staff. And um, my hunch is that, as in the past, they are, it's sort of the death of a thousand cuts. They're trying to push the whole facility in the direction of development. You know, after we had the big clash over introduction of yachts into the industrial facility, the port essentially forced them in. We did get some protections. The, the port went around to all their fishermen's terminal signs and wrote in a subscript, a port of Seattle property. Because you see, the fishermen understand fishermen's terminal as a cultural institution, as does most of Ballard and a lot of Seattle. It's just like the Pike Street Market. Uh, and so we look at the port of Seattle as a caretaker of a public trust. The port looks at Fisherman's Terminal as part of their real estate portfolio. And, um, you know, those two things do not necessarily jive. You know, and it's funny because not all port commissioners are, are on board with the port's priorities. It, the, the port of Seattle is like a huge super tanker that has tremendous momentum. Uh, and you may change skippers, you know, but uh, the rudder doesn't, changing the rudder doesn't do much. And so... It's important for people to follow port politics, and it's important for people to be involved in those port races because we have made progress in the last five years because of citizen involvement at the port. Okay, there is a lot more openness now. And, of course, if you've been reading the papers, you see that um, the corruption and the fraud at the port is starting to spill out into the papers finally. Uh, so it's important for people not to get cynical about it uh, in some ways, I support the Port of Seattle because it is a, it's a public agency, and its job is to promote the public welfare. When it first was established in the 20th century, it was considered communist and socialist and everything else uh, because it was, in, it was, it was uh, opening up the waterfront, which was at that time controlled by the railroad. Uh, and then post-World War II, the port sort of went through a metamorphosis where they didn't have to run levies anymore. They got exempted from that. And at that point, basically the wealthy in Seattle fell in love with the port because the port could do all these major projects with very little citizen oversight. And so now we have to bring that oversight back. I think there's a growing realization there's got to be fundamental structural changes to bring public oversight back to the port. The... Uh 
entity that the port is currently pitting fishermen against the wild salmon market is that the only entity there that you're competing with essentially uh, in addition to the the port staff were there other venues that uh, sell fish well no i mean that that's 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 um you know in some ways they're a small business too and i feel like um even though they've had a hand in this controversy I feel like in some ways the port almost uses this small business against the fishermen. I mean, in a way, uh, having people coming down and, and buying fish from us uh, encourages more people to find out where the terminal is and they can walk over to that fish market and buy all kinds of things because fishermen are limited in terms of what we can sell. We can only sell things that we catch. That's part of the restriction and that's a good restriction. We don't want brokers down there selling off boats. Um, but then people come down to the terminal, they can walk over to the fish market and buy, you know, they, 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 do, a good, they do a good job. Um, so, um, but yeah, that is the only venue down there right now. Um, so, you know, yeah, in the press, they kind of pit us up against those folks, but I, I think there's, there should be a symbiosis there. They also had in, I believe it was the Seattle Times article, a uh, representative of the port uh, saying to the effect that they needed to charge you this fee to be more responsive to the public's needs, you know, like the money's going to go to the public <laughs> coffers or it, something. It, it's very curious uh, when the port feels their fiduciary responsibility and, and when they feel like, hey, let's party, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, princess lines. Hey, yeah, we got 110 million. No problem. You know, uh, it's funny because I go to these fishermen's terminal advisory meetings and I'm sitting there in there with uh, most uh, most of the middle managers make at least six figures. So I'm sitting down there with other fishermen and we're on our own dime arguing for the public interest against a million dollars of salary sitting here. And they're saying, no, we've got to tax you twenty five dollars a day because it's our fiduciary responsibility. <laughs> It just makes you laugh. Well, as well as the, in addition to the mom and pop jobs that uh, the Fisherman's Terminal is supporting there, there's the rich history that you had pointed out with the uh, original creation of the terminal there. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, this is uh, Fisherman's Terminal and the Pike Street Market. I look at them as sort of the, 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 twin, the twin poles of Seattle history. Uh, you know, in fact, my great-grandfather... Uh, uh, set up one of the first shipyards in Ballard. He was he was there working as a shipwright in 1913 when Fisherman's Terminal was first built. Uh, and go down there and take a look at that Fisherman's Memorial and read the names on that, and you'll see all the ethnic groups. There's no place that's more multicultural in Seattle than Fisherman's Terminal. You know, you, you see almost a transformation from all the Nordics, and then you had then you had the Yugoslavs come in. You know, and then lately you've had uh, more of the Latino population, you know, Vietnamese. Um, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful, uh, a wonderful melting pot of um, uh, you know of, of people who have common maritime heritage. So um, yeah, it's a it's it's an economic engine, but it's also a cultural site. And I think a lot of times, um, port commissioners who don't have the Seattle background do not understand what they're messing with. All right, the sheds, the issue with the sheds. Did anything spur this beyond a um, internal change at Port of Seattle? Were, was there an accident at one of the sheds? No, or there, perhaps in another port facility, was there a similar accident? No, there's, there's never been a fire, to my knowledge, down there. Um, you, you know, when, when that study was done in 2001, 2002, it was called the Heartland Study. Uh, they're a real estate uh, corporation. They plan developments. Um, the port prefaced the study when it came out saying these recommendations will only be actualized if there are significant vacancies in the net sheds. Uh, so, you know, the port says, oh, Pete, you're spinning these conspiracy theories. And I go, well, let's put two and two together. Um, you know, it's there. So there was there was there, it's, there's no precipitating factor. That, uh, all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's become a crisis. Okay, they also mentioned a risk assessment manager and a risk ass assessment perhaps study. Right. Is that part of the Heartland or is that something different? No, that's a, that's a separate division in the port, but they're not autonomous within the port. And when the issue first started uh, coming up, they, they weren't referencing risk management. Now they, re they reference risk management. You know, so uh, it's... You know, they, a bureaucracy like that can always come up with a very thin rationalization that they can throw to the public 
And unless you have the time or the fanaticism to, to, to go through the news and, and pick it apart, it sounds reasonable on the surface, but believe me, it's, it's very thin what they're, what they're arguing. All right. Well, we've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, where can people turn to for further info on this? Okay. Well, I would, um, uh, you know, my family, family and friends have a fish business called Loki. Uh, and our website is um, L-O-K-I fish, LokiFish.com. And if you go there, you'll see right on that page um, a, uh, a link, two links, actually. One link is to the Seattle Times piece that came out last, last week that described this issue. And then the other link is to uh, a 12-page position paper uh, that I wrote, which I have submitted to the, to the Port Commission, which documents the history of this with documentation. So you can click on those links and educate yourself a little bit. And then after you educate yourself, and, you know, by all means, Google Fisherman's Terminal and see the history of, of this battle, then you can click on portseattle.org, which is the Port of Seattle website. Uh, and uh, when you get to their homepage, click on Commission, and you will instantly have all the emails of all the commissioners right there. And uh, send them, send them your, your, um, your sentiments. You know, tell, tell them what you think about you know, this manufacturing plant, this cultural icon in Seattle, how important it is to you, uh, the whole issue of direct fisherman sales. You, know, you can make a comment. Um, the other thing I would recommend is getting politically aware. These port commission races are always under the radar screen. People don't know what it's about. I mean, folks, this, they have a budget as big as the Seattle City Council. I mean, this is astonishing. Uh, they have an independent status in Washington state law. They have incredible power. They're probably the most powerful agency in the state of Washington. Um, so you get educated on port commission races. And I will say uh, that uh, Lloyd Hara, uh, you know, he's very much of a centrist guy. He was um, King County Auditor, Seattle City Treasurer. You know, um, he's not a flaming radical by any means, but he's a very honest guy, and he's given the fishermen a real fair shake down there. And I know he's, he's trying to push a positive notion of where we could take the terminal that would benefit the public, benefit the small fishermen. And he needs support. He's running for re-election. So you can go to his website, uh, Lloyd, that's double L, Hara, dot, dot uh, I believe it's dot com. Uh, and, uh, and also John Creighton is running for re-election. And of course, I, I, uh, I didn't back John when he first ran. He was, you know, he's uh, kind of on the Republican side of things. And I think his dad was president of Weyerhaeuser or something. Um, but he's been kind of surprising. And uh, he actually had some very good words to say uh, about fishermen to staff saying, hey, back off these guys, let them do their business last year. Uh, he's also done some fairly good things on the environment here uh, recently also. So, don't just be pissed off at the Port of Seattle and vote out the incumbents. That's how we lost Alec Fiskin last year, who was a dynamic port commissioner was trying to break it open. So bring those port commissioners uh, races up on, the, up on your radar screen. Really important. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you for coming in this morning.